All right, hi everyone. Um, let's get started. Um, so let's start with a question. Uh, why are we here? Um, that's kind of a big question, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, like, are we, why, why are you here at this talk? Hopefully to gain some better insight into how to have better design or engineering collaboration. Uh, we're here at this conference to celebrate CSS. Um, but I think if we ask a bigger why are we here question, there are some important lessons we can uh, learn. Like, why are we as humans and humans of a particular species here? Um, I think there are some important lessons to learn from our human history that we can apply to our day-to-day -day goals of effective interdisciplinary collaboration in the workplace. So I'm Teresa. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Yelp. I have a background in computer science, cognitive science, and philosophy. So I love the whys of questions as much as the hows. And I love bridging different disciplines, uh, seeing how they tackle the same questions from different perspectives and bringing them together. And by the end, I hope that's something that you'll also be excited about. Uh, I hope you'll all have a better understanding and a little more empathy for each other's disciplines and also armed with a few practical considerations for the day-to-day -day challenges of collaboration. So I'll be telling you a three-part story about what we can learn from our history and, and how that which made us, humans in general, successful in the long fight for existence in the world is the same that's going to make us, individuals here in this room, successful in our collaborations in the workplace. So let's start with an observation. Uh, we're everywhere. We settled so rapidly in so many distinct and ecologically different habitats. It's really extraordinary. Uh, we're on every continent, but why? Uh, why do we survive, but not our human cousins, like the physically stronger Neanderthals? Well, it turns out that um, the most likely answer is the same thing that makes the debate even possible. Uh, we conquered the world, uh, thanks above all to our unique language. So for anyone who hasn't read Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, uh, spoiler alert, here's the TLDR, Briefest History of Humankind, which is that through language, we're able to form shared beliefs that enable us to cooperate with strangers in order to create and use tools that help us make those shared beliefs and goals a reality, which creates community and culture. So for example, uh, my coworkers and I, we share a common belief in Yelp as a company, and we work together on the shared goal of driving forward Yelp's mission which is to connect people with great local businesses. Uh, we were founded in 2004, and in the past 14 years, we've grown a lot. So with all of these uh, users and reviews around the whole world, that means that there are a lot of different people uh, working in different disciplines, working on our apps. And as you can imagine, it becomes more and more difficult to keep track of all the design and engineering decisions being made. But wherever a user is using Yelp the app, uh, we wanted to make sure it looks like Yelp the brand. Because for us, and for most of you as well, uh, we want to provide the best possible product for our users. And one of the ways we do that is by building strong relationships between our design and engineering teams. Because strong relationships between design and engineering is the foundation for building a strong product. But before we even get to speaking to each other on a technical level about design and engineering topics, we need to start with our natural language. I'm going to spend a fair bit of time covering this language portion because that's really what we use to communicate with one another. And maybe that seems kind of obvious, but sometimes it's really these obvious realities that make the largest impact and are the most important to talk about. So let's start with what's so important about our human language. What's so special? Um, we aren't the only ones in this world with language. Um, but what's truly unique about ours is that that sets us apart isn't that we can talk about things that are relevant for immediate survival, like where people and lions and food and shelter are, but rather it's that we can talk about things that don't exist at all. So as far as we know, we're the only ones who can talk about entire kinds of entities that we've never seen or touched or smelled. Uh, we can speak about fictions. So our natural language enables us not merely to imagine things, but we can imagine them collectively. We can create concepts like corporations and countries and myths and ethics, and all of these beliefs really bind us together. So we don't just use our language to describe the world as it is, but we use it to describe the world as we want it to be. And we can weave these common myths that give us the unprecedented ability to cooperate in extremely flexible ways with countless numbers of strangers. And that's really what's amazing about our natural language. So if you're thinking that all this human nature anthropology stuff is a little bit too far removed to be applicable to the day-to-day -day realities of 2018 modern office work, uh, let's talk a bit more concretely about what our language tells us of our own work relationships. So the authors of Tribal Leadership, they conducted a 10-year field study 
of 24,000 people and two dozen organizations, and they found that every organization really acts as a small set of tribes, as they call it, as the basic building block of any large human effort. Uh, where they use the word tribe, I'm going to use the word circle. So your workplaces are made up of these circles of 20 to 150 people. Uh, and this is something we know, even if we're not aware of it. These are the people that you would say hi to uh, if you were walking down the street. And so every workplace is made up of these circles, but some are far more effective than others. Um, so the authors define five stages of cultures, with each stage describing the effectiveness of the circle. And what they found from their research is that we can determine the stage of a circle by the type of language that individuals in the circle use. And we can actually predict the performance of a circle by counting the number of people who speak the language at each stage. So in this chart, uh, they interviewed over 1,000 people in six companies and then looked for words that are said in close proximity to other words. So you can see the theme of what dialogue at each stage is about. And it isn't until stage four uh, where we see effective collaboration happening. It's where people collaborate and work together uh, propelled by a noble cause based on their values. And so over time, the language that uh, a person, an individual speaks, and that of the circle stage sync up so that the way that we can move our circle's performance uh, forward to the next level, where we can effectively collaborate with one another, is actually by moving many people forward individually, uh, by facilitating them to use a different language, which then actually shifts their behavior accordingly. So we want to build these kinds of stable stage four cultures in our own workplaces in a way that encompasses both designers and engineers. And in order to do that, it's not only saying the words of that stage that matter, but it's also uh, how we say it and the context in which we say it. Because words are really about how we use them. Because we speak differently under different circumstances. And I think that's something we intuitively know, um, even without thinking about it. Like, think about the way uh, you speak. You change your vocabulary, your usage, your grammar, depending on who you're speaking to. Uh, we communicate one way with our peers, another with our parents, or children are hockey coaches. Like my friends tell me that when I speak English to my Chinese parents, my English takes on a Chinese accent. So we make all of these dialectical adjustments below the level of conscious awareness. And that means that we need to be wary um, of using the word designer or engineer, that we don't use them with some connotation of them being the other. If you're an engineer amongst engineers, you might say something like, oh, design just wants this because it looks nice. I don't know how complicated it is. Or if you're a designer amongst designers, you might complain about the lack of polish from engineering. Like, oh, design engineers just don't care about these visual details. But every time we say something like that, um, when we think of someone as the other, we're slowly eroding our collaborative culture. So as an action item for all of you, um, go out and get a coffee with a designer or engineer that you don't yet work closely with. Um, that'll also help you better explain what you do, because it's, sometimes it can be hard to communicate the things that you've learned over the years that feel very natural to you when you're so immersed in your own discipline, but talking to someone else about it um, will actually help you with that. So moving on from our natural language, uh, we can start to form a more technical des uh, design language for our designers and engineers to share. So a design language is the overall visual design of a product, and a language is a formal system of meaningful symbols that allow us to communicate with one another. So for a design language, uh, that means having a collection of components that are defined by principles and patterns with standard semantic symbols, such as colors, type, shape, spacing, icons, motion, et cetera, uh, for everyone to share and understand. So clear and consistent rules are what makes languages successful. So for designers and engineers to effectively work together, uh, they have to be first speaking the same design language. At Yelp, we started working on our design system over five years ago uh, when we were doing a redesign of our business listing page. Uh, our front end code base was getting out of control, and the Photoshop, back when designers were still using Photoshop, uh, to code workflow just wasn't cutting it anymore. So as the designs of, for our new business listening page started to take shape, um, it became clear that we were establishing the future of Yelp's look and feel. So we started pulling out components that could be reused and uh, making a design system out of that. Um, and now that design system surfaces existing solutions for designers and engineers. But a lot has changed over the past five years. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, we changed the way that our engineering teams were organized. We used to have separate web, Android, and iOS teams. So the web team was responsible for building out all the web features. But now we have cross-product teams um, across um, product verticals. So teams are all working on the same feature for different platforms. So we have one team that's responsible for our contributions, like reviews, photo uploads. And we have another team working on reservations so you can book a table on Yelp. 
But now, as designers and engineers focus on more discrete areas of the app for their particular platform, uh, we can start to lose track of our larger design system, which leads to this, vi uh, this fragmented visual language and everyone speaking their own dialect. So for example, uh, we recently did a component audit of our design system across platforms, and we found that our one design language had really split off into three different dialects. What we called an alert on web was a message alert box on Android, banner notification view on iOS, and designers were calling it a page alert. So having a shared language is really important to us, so we've been working on consolidating that. So get your designers and engineers to share the same vocabulary, and from there, you can start to define the shared goals. So as an action item, um, if you have a design system, uh, audit the language. Uh, write a glossary if you have to. So designers and engineers might have different ideas of what a component is. Or even engineers um, in different disciplines, there might be differing opinions as to what counts as a component and what components are part of your standard library. So have a conversation around that. And if you don't have a design system yet, uh, you can consider start to build one. There are many great resources out there, such as the Design Systems Handbook. Uh, Diana Mounter is one of the authors on it. Thank you for writing it. it was, it's really good. Um, OK, so now, once we have all this shared vocabulary, what does all this language stuff actually get us? Well, it, it allows us to express our ideals, our dreams, our goals, and to actually understand one another. So it means that we can talk to one another in order to cooperate. And the next step is to actually use it, to actually use our language and talk to one another. So I sat down with some designers and engineers and Yelp and interviewed them about what they felt their goals were to see where design and engineering goals really overlap. So this is what designers want you to know. Um, in a very broad sense, the goal of every product designer is to be able to solve the user's problems, whether that's very small on a UI level, like how do we highlight a call to action, to being very on, a, on a very high level, like how do we get users to come back and be engaged. So because of that, they're constantly balancing trade-offs um, that they make on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they're constantly balancing business needs with user needs with engineering feasibility. So it's easy to criticize the design when you're unaware of all the trade-offs that they've had to make in order to reach that design. Trade-offs, for example, of sleek versus usable. Our products cover a very large audience. Some people are very tech savvy, some aren't. We have to make accessibility considerations. So, there are a lot of trade-offs that designers have had to make by the time you see the final mock-up. And also, design is actually far less subjective than you may think it is. Uh, decisions aren't made just because it looks nice. There's usually a reason. So user behavior is considered, like, where should we place a button if our users are left-handed versus if most of them are right-handed? Uh, why should we use a button instead of a link? And even for things like font sizes and colors, it's not just because it looks nicer. It's often about visual hierarchy. So when a user is scanning the page, we only have their attention for maybe a second. And so when their eyes land on that page, what are they most likely to see? Our eyes, eyes naturally fall somewhere, so design is all about directing that attention. And engineers, designers really do care about you and your work. Uh, they know that a pretty mock that isn't technically feasible isn't the right solution. And designers care about performance as well, because every millisecond that the page land, uh, loads slower makes an impact. And as for what engineers want you to know, uh, sometimes a change that looks simple is actually far more complicated than you may think. Because we would all love for our code bases to be perfect, but often there's code debt that gets in the way of us being able to do things as efficiently or easily as we'd like. So for example, let's say design wants to increase the inset here from 8 pixels to 16 pixels. At first glance, it looks, oh, that's, that's easy. You just bump up the number. But what's actually happening is that every single one of these elements defines their own inset. So that's not a thing that you can do at the page level. And to change the inset means going through every class and changing that number from 8 to 16. And also, these components aren't just used there. Uh, they're used all across the app. So we have to consider how to make our components both reusable and flexible. So just because something looks like a minor change doesn't mean that it is. Something like this actually ended up uh, changing like 100 files. This is a real case. And we know that sometimes it can, t uh, it can feel like it takes a very long time to do development work. Uh, and that's because things come up. Sometimes things come up in code reviews. Sometimes we're blocked on things uh, by other teams touching code that we need. And engineers also do love visual consistency and code consistency, because good code can and should enforce consistency. 
And really, at the end of the day, we do care a lot about shipping a great product to the user. Uh, we don't want to ship bugs, and we really do care about design. So comparing the goals of the engineer and the designer, the end goal really comes down to the same thing, which is creating the best possible product for our users. And we have unique perspectives on that common goal, and that's how and why we work together. So as an action item for all of you, um, take a note of what are the shared beliefs and goals that unite your designers and engineers? Uh, what are your design and engineering principles? What are your company goals? And what's your mission statement? And most importantly, is everyone aware of that? All of those nice mission statements and goals, they're only effective if everyone actually understands and believes in them. All right, so let's get to the very practical stuff. Uh, tips for the nitty gritty day in, day out communication that actually gets things done. So my team at Yale spent a few quarters studying our design workflow, uh, how our product goes from design ideation to mock-ups, the handoff to engineers, and then through that development process. And this is some advice from what we learned. Designers, don't be afraid to talk to your engineers and ask them for an early opinion. Engineers, don't be afraid to talk to your designers. Because we found that sometimes engineers didn't talk to their designers at all during the design process. An engineer would receive a mock-up and then immediately start to work on it. And then later, they'd come across some design issues like, oh, this component is slightly different than the one we currently have in our design system. Did you mean to use a green button when all our buttons are blue? Our default margin is 12 pixels. Did you mean to make this 18? Or two engineering teams would simultaneously build the same component when they could have just put it once in our design system. So sometimes engineers don't even ask about those things when they come up, but they will take the mock-up to be like the truth rather than what was in the design system. So if your engineers aren't talking to your designers in the design process, there will probably be issues that come up later that could have been addressed earlier by simply having a conversation before development began. So understand how and when product decisions are made in your company. Take a look at that timeline and look at where design and engineering overlap. See where you can turn that process into more of a conversation between designers and engineers rather than just a handoff. And if your design and engineering team sit separately, try having them sit together, uh, designers with the engineers who are working on the feature. Because don't discount how important those casual water cooler chats really are. Because meetings have too high of an overhead for casual exchanges, and you want to make it as easy as possible for designers and engineers to talk to one another. Because yes, it's 2018, and we have all sorts of ways to communicate virtually, be it IRC, Google Hangouts, Slack, HipChat, Facebook for Work, et cetera. But think of your own comfort level when you have to ping a stranger that you've never spoken to versus the person sitting right next to you. So that comfort level comes from repeat interactions and familiarity with their presence. Some people are more outgoing than others. They'll say hi to strangers in the elevator. Some people aren't. And going on offsites is a great way to break that ice. Because remember, we want to build circles that include both designers and engineers. So feature teams at Yelp have started including designers in the offsites, and that's really helped with team building. So now designers don't feel like they have more allegiance to their design team uh, rather than their engineering team. They feel like they're equally part of both teams. And consider which design and engineering decisions need to be made earlier on. And the only way you're going to know that is by asking the designer or engineer. Because, as we already saw, some seemingly small design changes can cause larger engineering changes. So have a conversation around feasibility while the design is still in the exploratory stage. But when we started carving out time in our product design, development timeline for that, for designers to share their work earlier with engineers, we actually found that sometimes engineers didn't really know what kind of feedback to give or what to specifically watch out for. So we created a checklist for them that covers things like for each mock-up of which components is it comprised, what will it look like on different screen sizes? Are there any error states? Are there edge cases? What will interactions look like? What happens when a user does X? Is a copy on the page finalized? Are the assets such as icon and illustrations available? What will this look like in another language if the strings are much longer? So these checklists are a great way for coping with the limits of human attention and memory. And it's an accessible tool for everyone to use. But beyond checklists, uh, we can also create more sophisticated tools that actually bridge design and engineering. Because communication isn't easy. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to be considerate and kind. But we can reduce cognitive load wherever we can in order to better use that mental energy for the tasks that really matter to us. 
So the first evidence for tool production uh, dates back to about two and a half million years ago, and the manufacture and use of tools is actually the criteria by which archaeologists use to recognize ancient humans. These were things like uh, hammer stones and sharp stone flakes uh, for cutting, uh, and these tools made it easier for us to do things. And since then, we've been able to create tools that are a little bit more sophisticated and for more specific use cases. So for example, one of the tools that we've created is Yelpicons. It's a cross-platform icon build system that solved our problem of sharing assets. A few years ago, this is what our icons look like. Uh, they were wildly different. We had many shades of colors. There was no singular grid to work off of. That's where we came from, and this is where we are now. So our designers created this beautiful family of icons that work on all our different platforms within this bounding box so that they're centered wherever they're used, and they have like, details for each pixel density. And this makes it really easy to swap around icons because they all fit within this box. And we have all these different apps that now use this consistent family of icons. So great, we have all these beautiful icons, but how do we actually get them to the engineers for them to put in our apps? As many of you have probably experienced, it's a little bit of a pain to share assets. So we use this hodgepodge system. It's like, oh, it's in the JIRA ticket. No, it's in the Dropbox. Or I emailed that to you, but that was two weeks ago. We're not using it. The suitcase anymore, it's a briefcase now. So since, since the L product is supported on so many devices, um, each image had to define icon size and device independent pixels. So we had 2x, 3x uh, densities for all of these. And we really needed a way to automate this stuff. Uh, we need a system that could support the conversion and scaling of icons and then publish a package that could be consumed by our apps. So we created our icon system. Uh, so now once an icon is designed, the illustrators commit an SVG to a repo, and then that automatically triggers a Jenkins build that validates the file and creates the variations in the different formats needed for web, iOS, and Android, with each platform receiving a package of all the assets that they need. So for developers to use those new assets, it's as easy as bumping the version in package.json or requirements.txt and the equivalent for iOS and Android. So our developers can then easily access those assets through code, ensuring that no errors are made in that handoff process. So designers at Yelp have stopped exporting icons um, for over a year now. A designer can instead just say, oh, I'm using 18 by 18 briefcase, um, no more email or JIRA. Um, and now developers can just use the icons right where they need them. And a project like this is only possible as a collaborative effort between designers and engineers of different platforms. So Yelpcons was an example of a tool uh, that helps us do things, uh, but we can also create tools that help us organize and share information. So even though we started making tools at least two and a half million years ago, we didn't actually figure out how to write things down until around 5,000 years ago. But once we did, we effectively extended the natural limits of human history by preserving our memories on clay tablets and cave walls, and eventually on papyrus and parchment and Microsoft Word and Google Docs, Instagram, Twitter. So these days, we have all sorts of these tools uh, to help us organize and store the information that we write down. But the purpose is still very much the same. Uh, it's to offload a great deal of the processing that our neurons would do to an external device that then becomes an extension of our own brains, turning us into cyborgs and allowing us to keep track of details that we can't trust ourselves to remember. So by writing things down, um, we make knowledge available for future us to refer to, and we're better able to share that knowledge among the community, across teams and disciplines. And you probably already use multiple tools for this. Uh, you probably have some sort of tool for sharing things like mock-ups and code and tracking issues and comments. But whatever tools your team use, make sure everyone has access. If design is using tool X for design reviews and engineering is using tool Y for code reviews, make sure that your engineers have access to tool X and your designers have access to tool Y. And you also want one way of tracking design and implementation issues. Like will they be tracked in, in vision, as a JIRA ticket, as a spreadsheet? Whatever it is, make sure that everyone knows what it is. Um, because each company is different, so find out what works for you. And also, engineers uh, probably have some sort of development playground within which they make their changes, and maybe another staging area before changes go out to production. So if that's the case, um, make sure to share that development playground with design when the work is still in progress, so you can catch a lot of the issues before they actually go out. And all of these tools, they take the information that we already have tucked away inside our heads, or our own work, and it makes them accessible for everyone else as well. And 
beyond that, we can also create tools to reinforce our shared design language to bridge that gap between the disciplines. So we have our design system, and we expect it to be this single source of truth. But in reality, there's really a separate system for design, web, iOS, and Android. Like design's components are in sketch files, web components are in Cheetah and React, and then iOS and Android yet still have their own native components. So we started out with this great shared design language, and then slowly over time, uh, Pox people start creating their own dialect. This is everywhere in our natural language. It's like in America, someone says, can I get an orange pop? And you're like, what's pop? Do you mean soda? Or here in, uh, in Australia, someone would be like, hey, do you want to get Maccas for brekkie? And then I look all confused, and they're like, oh, do you want to get McDonald's for breakfast? So it, it's hard to maintain these systems that are separate, but supposed to be the same. Uh, any change requires coordination, um, and that means what's in design and what's in code don't always match, and eventually over time, the design and code components drift apart. So everyone has a different version of what they consider to be the truth. You'll see that these are just a little bit different, and these little differences can sometimes cause a sharp-eyed engineer to build out a new component just to match the design spec entirely. So that's what we're trying to solve by generating sketch files from code. There are open source projects out there, such as React Sketch App and HTML Sketch App, that will generate sketch files from code. At Yelp, we don't use React Native, so for web, we've been working on integrating HTML Sketch App and HTML Sketch App CLI into our design system, so that every time we update a component in code, it triggers the Jenkins build to generate a new sketch file of our design components that then automatically uploads to our designer's Dropbox. Meanwhile, for iOS and Android, there's nothing out there yet, so we created our own sketch generators from scratch. Um, and this is actually a screenshot from our iOS sketch generator. Um, which we will be open sourcing in maybe the next month, so keep your eye out for that. And tools like this are important because they're capable of reinforcing our shared language. And other benefits are also that it's much easier for us to automatically spit out a bunch of permutations of a component than it is for a designer to do that. For example, these are our business passports, and these are all the different ways that they can look under different circumstances. So we can catch edge cases earlier this way in design. And we can also generate entire pages of our app in Sketch. So these are real Sketch files generated from our app, so we can see what design changes look like across the entire app. So now designers and engineers don't have to go back and forth on whether something's part of the design language or whether something looks right. There's truly a single source of truth now with a shared vocabulary, so that when you say something like alert button, everyone knows exactly what you're referring to. So maintaining consistency is really hard, but it's necessary if we're to effectively collaborate with one another. So this sketch generator is a tool that reinforces the vocabulary of our shared language, which actually takes us back full circle. So from that single source of truth, we can have this shared language with which to communicate about shared goals, enabling us to collaborate effectively and to create even better tools for reinforcing our shared language. So we started out with our language and its ability to describe that which does not yet exist, to communicate to one another the ideal world we want to live in. And that enables us to work together to form a community that strives towards making those goals a reality. Because at the bottom of it, effective design and engineering collaboration is really just corporate speak for effective human collaboration. And we've been learning how to do that our whole lives. Um, even if you don't have the resources to create the tools that you need, the important part is that we know what it means to communicate with respect, compassion, and sensitivity, and to set aside our differences in order to listen, understand, and just care a little bit better for each other. And that's what effective design and engineering collaboration is really all about. Uh, so these slides are available uh, at teresa.ma slash cssconfau.pdf uh, if you want to refer to any notes. And thank you all for listening.